Two years ago, we were all mocking Joe Burrow to the Bengals at number one overall, and now they are in the Super Bowl. Don't also forget that last year, we were all debating Penny Sewell versus Jamar Chase for the Bengals, and that choice had Super Bowl level implications to it. This is the way you build a Super Bowl contender, y'all. Or, you know, you could do what the Rams did and trade away every draft pick for a decade for one shot at it. We going to the Super Bowl, and we going to win that bitch. As Tom Brady said on Twitter, there is more than one way to bake a cake, but the draft is the best way, just so we're clear. Now, in the last few years, we have had a large influx of young, talented quarterbacks come through the draft, so much so that at that pace, we probably would have had more quarterbacks than starting spots, but life finds a way. Life, uh... And the talent in the draft pool this season shows us how the pendulum has swung the other way to balance them out with a class that is deep with pass rushers. If this is your first time seeing one of my mock drafts, I appreciate you clicking on this video. Make sure you hit that like button, subscribe if you like what you see, and let's dive right in with the Jaguars at number one overall. This is a really unique draft season and I'm excited to get it started. There's not a Joe Burrow in this draft class, so teams are gonna have to work even harder to turn over every rock to find those diamonds in the rough. Luckily for the Jaguars, they already have their quarterback in Trevor Lawrence. Don't let the naysayers get you down on him. He's legit. What the Jaguars really need to find is a way to get Trent Baalke out of there so they can find themselves a head coach. But until then, just build around Trevor Lawrence. And I think that's why a lot of people have them taking Alabama offensive tackle Evan Neal here, but this dude just doesn't scream generally offensive talent to me like you better be Orlando Pace if I take you at number one overall I think that Eric Fisher burned me and I'm not taking an offensive lineman with the first overall pick honestly I'm trading out if I can find a buyer but without an elite quarterback that's gonna be a tough sell after quarterback the next positional value comes from the guys that chase them down and this year Kayvon Thibodeau versus Aiden Hutchinson is gonna replace that usual quarterback battle that we have at the top of the draft and I think that I'm in the minority here but I'll dissect these two in their own separate video later on to keep this quick one guy has a higher ceiling and a lower floor, while the other is a safe blue collar type. I'm gonna go with the guy that's got the much higher ceiling. He has been the next big thing since he was in high school, and that's KT. But I do understand the Hutchinson love. I'm just not willing to settle over the potential of Kayvon. And then at number two, we've got the Detroit Lions. And those that have been with me for a long time, they know that I do love a good draft story. Now I'll admit the Jaguars taking KT makes it a fun scenario to be able to keep Aiden Hutchinson close to Ann Arbor, but it's not even the proximity that makes this a great fit. Dan Campbell needs guys like Aiden Hutchinson over a finesse edge rusher like KT. This dude is a kneecap biter, blue collar, hard worker, long lost Bosa brother, and a building block for Dan Campbell to really build around. At number three, we've got the Houston Texans, and there are rumors floating around that Larry Tunsil could be on the move, and with the Texans already having a needed offensive line, I'm gonna assume that this is a blow the whole thing up kind of move, and that would make Evan Neal a very good place to start rebuilding. Davis Mills was pretty solid for a third round pick in his rookie season, so keep him around until he proves that he's not the guy. Spend this season building a foundation that can facilitate quarterback success for the future. At number four, here we go again with these New York Jets. They are like the new Browns now with all these high draft picks with nothing to show for them. If I'm Joe Douglas, I'm taking the best football player in this draft class, and that is Kyle Hamilton. Now we're a long ways away from the draft and so much can change, but if he's making a full recovery, I am ignoring the positional value for this unicorn, not taking a chance on him being there still at number 10. I'll settle for an offensive lineman that falls there instead of missing a Derwin James for my defense. Staying in New York, we have got the New York Giants, and I could make the same joke about their terrible performances during the last few years. This has actually been the worst span of football in New York in NFL history. Luckily, the Giants have moved on from Dave Gettleman, and he only set the franchise back like a decade or so, you know. But Daniel Jones might actually have a chance with Brian Dable as his head coach. However, he is going to need an offensive line in front of him. I don't typically allow betting odds to influence my mock drafts, but when I saw that Iki Iquanu was the betting favorite to go number one, one overall well that certainly did get my attention don't get me wrong he is a solid offensive lineman and with Andrew Thomas breaking out for the Giants last year you could argue that they don't need an offensive tackle but Iki Aquanu could play any position along the offensive line he is the Rashawn Slater of this draft class and he's not going to make it past number six so the Giants would be wise to take him at five if they want a massive upgrade in their offensive line 
At number six, we've got the Panthers. And I said that Iki Aquani wouldn't make it past number six because the Panthers tried to use tape and popsicle sticks as blockers for Sam Darnold and wondered why they got the same version of him that we saw in Gang Green. And with Iki being local, well, this is another one of those potential cool draft stories that would be a slam dunk for me. But Charles Cross is the next guy up at offensive tackle, has an equally high ceiling as any offensive tackle in this class. I wasn't sure if he was going to actually even declare for the draft. I'm so glad that he did. And I know three offensive linemen in the top six picks isn't exactly second but this is a strength of this particular draft class and with so many teams having a huge need at offensive tackle these guys are going to go fast and early all right and the giants are back on the clock with the offensive lineman secured at number five the giants can turn their attention to the pass rush we don't know exactly what kind of defense stable is going to be running but we do know that lorenzo carter is a free agent and last year's second round pick aziz ojalari is a potential steal but he's small and is going to need a bigger beefier edge opposite of him so i say go get the grittiest defensive lineman in this class and that is Purdue's George Karloftis. He is a perfect complement to Aziz Ojolari. He brings the power to Ojolari's speed. I almost had the Giants taking him at number five because he's the best option to appeal to the old Giants fans who, you know, want to see a return to their old glory days. And Karloftis is as old school as they come. They don't make him like this anymore. He's got a blue collar motor that doesn't give up. Is that enough cliches for you guys? Let's move on. At number eight, we have got the Atlanta Falcons. And last year, they kind of ignored their top needs and took the best player available, who was also the unicorn of the 2021 NFL Draft. At the time, it wasn't a need. Now that they've lost Calvin Ridley to whatever's going on down there, it ended up being the best pick they could have made in, in that scenario. And now they've got a shot at a pretty unique player here that might not be at the top of their list of needs, but is a very talented player. And that is Derek Stingley Jr. I'm still not sure how I feel about the risk with Stingley but this feels like his floor as long as he tests and interviews well during the draft process. At number nine, we have got the Denver Broncos on the clock, and this is where the draft really starts to get hella interesting. The Broncos are going to have a quarterback overdrafted in every mock draft to date, but I've been a believer that the Broncos were going to hitch their wagon to a veteran quarterback for a while. So long, in fact, that I even traded for Cortland Sutton in my deep keeper fantasy league, and then a week after that trade, the Broncos re-signed Cortland Sutton to a long-term deal, and then he was just never heard from again, but that changes with Aaron Rodgers. Everything changes with Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson. In fact, it's unlikely that they even have this number nine overall pick if they trade for one of these veteran quarterbacks. So instead of wasting one of the top quarterbacks in the draft to a team in this mock that's not even going to go the rookie route, let's pretend like the Broncos somehow hold on to this pick after a veteran quarterback trade. They're going to instill confidence in that quarterback, much like the Buccaneers did with Tom Brady, and they're going to work on the offensive line. Kenyon Green is another versatile mammoth that could play multiple spots, but it's probably best suited along the interior. At number 10, the Jets are back on the clock, and they would have really liked for Kenyon Green to make it past the Broncos, and he very well could because this mock already feels way too offensive line top heavy. But hey, it's a February mock draft. What do you want? And in fact, the Jets, they could pass on an offensive lineman altogether with these two first rounders and just hope and pray that Guy Becton and Elijah Vera Tucker develop quickly to secure that left side of the offensive line, leaving the right side to be addressed likely via free agency. Much like how they addressed the pass rush last year with Carl Lawson, hopefully without the injury redshirt season but the defense can't rely on Lawson to come back and save this pass rush by himself. David Ajabu could use some seasoning and a veteran presence like Lawson would be instrumental in his development because Ajabu has all the physical tools you look for to be a well-rounded edge rusher even though this might be a little bit early for him. However Kyle Hamilton and David Ajabu would be an insane upgrade for Robert Salah in this defense. At number 11, we've got the Washington Commanders. Now, I'm always trying to get ahead of things that are going to make my videos outdated because it seems like that's just a thing. So I waited for the new logo to drop because, you know, graphics are important around here. Meanwhile, there's still people using the old Panthers and Seahawks logo in their NFL content, but I digress. Even with a new logo and uniforms, this poverty franchise probably won't be able to convince one of these veteran quarterbacks to come play for them on their knee eater turf. So they're going to be forced to ruin some young kid's future with a draft Sorry, Matt Corral. Maybe he was trying to scare him off with that injury in the Ole Miss Bowl game, but probably won't work. I do think that Matt Corral is the best quarterback prospect in this class, but I haven't looked closely enough to say that confidently. He seems to have all the tools that you look for in today's quarterbacks. He's actually very similar to Taylor Heineke, but a vast improvement as an overall passer. Come
At number 12, we have got the Vikings, and it's okay, Vikings fans. You can come out now. Mike Zimmer can no longer hurt you. You guys have got to believe that that cornerback draft curse has been lifted now, and you may address this position once and for all, or for at least a few years. Clemson is a great place to start. They've been a cornerback or a defensive back factory for quite a while now. They do have sort of mixed results in the NFL, but Andrew Booth Jr. has the tools to be a really good cornerback at the next level. Without some of the top pass rushers still on the board, I think that this is pretty much necessary. At number 13, the Cleveland Browns are on the clock, and Odell Beckham Jr. is thriving in LA without the Browns, and all of a sudden, this wide receiver corpse is not looking like the group that can elevate Baker Mayfield beyond a progressive commercial. This year, I'm going to recreate my top 10 wide receivers video from a couple years ago, but spoiler alert, neither of the Ohio State wide receivers are my number one wide receiver. Nothing personal against them. I just think they lack a certain something for my preference, but there's definitely going to be a home for them in today's NFL passing game. Chris Olave would be my preferred option between the two because his route running and deep speed he reminds me of Justin Jefferson I think that he would have it also a quick translation to instant results in the NFL at number 14 we've got the Baltimore Ravens and with the way that Lamar Jackson plays it was only a matter of time before an injury caught up with him and honestly it is a win that it was as at minor of an injury as it was so it's not going to impact him long term but let's be honest he wasn't the same after that virus we don't speak of anyways now after a season off he's going to have to watch his division rival go to the Super Bowl maybe even win the whole thing Lamar's going to be hungrier than ever and the Ravens have got a lot of draft capital as a result of this season being sacrificed which is important because there are a a lot of crucial free agents for the Ravens including their center Brad Bozeman and I'm saving my money and hoping that Tyler Linderbaum makes it to 14 in the draft because Bozeman has been an erratic snapper and Linderbaum he brings a toughness that this offensive line has missed since Marshall Yonder retired. All right, at number 15 and 16, we've got the Eagles back to back. This is the first of their three first round picks, which is quite a long fall from the three top five picks they were once projected to have at one point during the season. But this is still a great opportunity for them to build around Jalen Hurts. The Eagles are probably going to let Derek Barnett walk in free agency. And also they'll be moving on from Brandon Graham within the next year or so. Josh Sweat is nice, but much like with the teams up I-95, you need pass rushers. Trayvon Walker is a big athletic edge to pair with the speed of Josh Josh Sweat. So I'm going to take him at number 15 and I really want to upgrade the offense with one of these three picks, but I'm just not seeing the value. Maybe Drake London here because the Eagles could definitely use another wide receiver, but are you really going to draft a wide receiver in the first round three years in a row? I just don't see it. Now I'm going to transform this defense to complement the number one rushing attack. This time I'm getting another outside cornerback with the sauce. That's Sauce Gardner. This guy would give the Eagles a nice long cornerback to match up with the long wide receivers within the division. At number 17, we've got the LA Chargers, and there's no need to beat around the bush with some football foreplay. The Chargers gotta fix this run defense. I mean, it was terrible. Jordan Davis would be a fun option, and I love this dude, but I just don't see him going before DeMarvin Leal. Leal is a three down defensive tackle that provides some pass rush. Jordan Davis is really going to limit defensive personnel packages in the NFL because he's a liability on passing downs. I've been fooled too many times by the college mammoth nose tackle in the past, and DeMarvin Leal has already fallen too far in my opinion but this is going to be a hard choice if faced with both of these guys on the board at number 18 we have got the new orleans saints and they were my favorite place for russell wilson and sean payton up and retired and i'm afraid we're about to enter a very dark age for the saints sean payton left them with tim tebow 2.0 at quarterback he left the team in salary cap hell and likely a defensive minded head coach who's already failed in his previous stop as a head coach whoever ends up playing quarterback for them is going to need better weapons regardless i am taking the patient approach here and banking on jamison williams getting a red shirt rookie season as he recovers from that torn ACL. This also lets things with Michael Thomas play out and see what the future holds with them. Either way, the Saints come away with a very unique wide receiver in Jameson Williams. All right, in the 19, the Eagles are back on the clock again. They have addressed the defensive line and the secondary. That's two out of the three levels of the defense. And much like Howie Roseman, it's been that second level that I've neglected thus far. And I'm going to say this. If the Eagles make three first round picks and don't take a linebacker, then I'm going to retire linebacker from their draft boards for all future mock drafts. I feel like I've been doing this since I learned how to do mock drafts and they have never taken one. Well, N'Kobe Dean is the linebacker that they've been waiting for. He might not be as athletic as some of the other linebackers we've seen come through here in the first round recently, but he's an instinctual playmaker. 
At pick 20, we've got the Steelers on the clock, and you know where this is going. This is my cute mock where I send players home sweet home. I actually backtracked on this idea when I heard Kevin Colbert was stepping down as the Steelers GM, because first year GMs don't want to tie their success to a rookie quarterback so quickly, but Colbert might see this as an opportunity to take the future quarterback as his last first round pick for the franchise. Colbert is a Pittsburgh native. He kept James Conner in Pittsburgh. He watched Big Ben get drafted as the director of football operations. Does he really want Mason Rudolph to be the top quarterback he ever drafts? Nah, give me the man that was so innovative. The NCAA had to create a new rule to prevent fake sliding. An Azure ACC representative scout on YouTube. I probably should be more comfortable with Kenny Pickett as a prospect already, but I think that's because I want to like him more than I truly do. But he's already 24 years old. He's making excuses for his small hands. I don't know. Stay tuned as I dive deeper into him as draft season goes on. But to me, this feels like the Mac Jones Patriots scenario last year where this is going to be his floor, right? There's no way that Kenny Pickett makes it past the Steelers. Speaking of the Patriots, they are up at 21 and they're going to lose JC Jackson to free agency. So of course they're going to take cornerback in the first, right? Not so fast, my draft nerds. That's exactly what Belichick wants us to think so that he can pivot away from cornerback in the first, or at least that's what he wants us to think. I, I'm confused. Well played, Bill. Well played. I still don't think that he goes cornerback in the first because this year's Bill Belichick prospect of the draft is Utah linebacker Devin Lloyd. This dude can do it all from cover to pass rush to run blitz. Belichick loves Loves the versatile defenders and that is Devin Lloyd. He was the Utah Utes defense in 2021. One of my favorite players in this class. The only reason that I have N'Kobe Dean going before him is just because I think that Dean is a better fit scheme wise for the Eagles. And like I said, I was just trying to find somebody that fits what they've been looking for. At number 22, we've got the Las Vegas Raiders, and they just signed Josh McDaniels as their head coach. And as far as I know, he has not bailed on them just yet. So it's looking like we are going to see part two of Josh McDaniels in the AFC West. And I'm actually really excited to see what he does with Derek Carr. I feel like we expected John Gruden to come out and do all these innovative things with Derek Carr. But when it came down to it, Gruden was always an old school passer. But I think that Derek Carr is what Josh McDaniels hoped for when he drafted Tim Tebow in the first round. And I think that we could see Carr take a lot more advantage of his mobility in 2022. However, Jordan Davis is the most Al Davis draft pick that you could make in 2022. And he fits the needs on this defense. I think the Max Crosby is even more dominant with the Jordan Davis inside eating blood locks this pick is a home run fit for me next up we've got the cardinals on the clock the cardinals have needed a cornerback since pat pete was still around byron murphy was a step in the right direction and they've got some pretty good safeties but robert alford is 33 and there's not much else behind those two if you're going to be an offensive football team and you're going to be putting up a lot of points you need cornerbacks to keep up with the track meet on the other end auburn's roger mccreary is a solid cornerback prospect that projects to an outside corner that can be kicked inside but i like buddha baker in the slot jalen thompson playing deep safety with murphy and mccreary on the outsides and even then the cardinals still probably need more cornerback depth later on in this draft. At 24, we've got the Dallas Cowboys on the clock, and they wisely brought Dan Quinn back as a coach in waiting and defensive coordinator because there might not be a man in the NFL with more pressure on him than Mike McCarthy will have in 2022. And if he buckles, Dan Quinn might have a future as the head coach in Dallas. On top of that extension, I'm sure that there's a promise to improve the defense with a top draft pick. However, much like the Eagles neglecting their linebacking core, the Cowboys like to do the same with their safety position. Even though Michigan and Penn State have great safety prospects this year, I don't think that that's going to end up being the pick in April as it never is. Personally, as a fan, my dream is for Tyler Linderbaum to be there. I can see the cracks forming in this once great offensive line and I want to patch things up before things start to crumble. However, however, I also once felt like Tyler Biotish was a really good center prospect and I've been underwhelmed with him thus far. But if Linderbaum is not there, I think that the interior offensive line is a position to fill later on. Randy Gregory is going to be a big loss for this defense. And instead of asking too much of Micah Parsons, let's get some more pass rush help. I do like what I saw from Osa Odigizua and Chauncey Golston, but those guys don't provide the speed off the edge like Randy Gregory does. Jermaine Johnson is one of the most well-rounded defensive ends in this class. He's probably regretting leaving Georgia because they won the national championship. But then again, he might not have had the opportunity to shine like he did at FSU. At number 25, we've got the Buffalo Bills, and I had them going wide receiver in the first before the Gabriel Davis game. It's honestly a shame that the Bills had to lose in such an iconic game for the young wide receiver, but on the right side, they've got such a solid young prospect to build on. So now I've got them flipping to the other side because Tredavious White has not been himself lately, and the Bills need more bodies back there even when he is healthy. Trent McDuffie is a really fun player from the UW DB Factory, and Washington defensive backs actually have a really high hit rate in the NFL. I think he's got safety potential down the road if he's 
he's not quite athletic enough to hang with NFL wide receivers, but that's perfect because the Bills' safeties, while they are two of the best in the league, they're both over 30 and could see a decline in the next few years. At pick number 26, we've got the Tennessee Titans on the clock, and they might be a dark horse in this veteran quarterback market this offseason because they tried to put the offense on Ryan Tannehill's back in that playoff game against the Bengals, and he couldn't get it done. I do credit the reinsertion of Derrick Henry as cause for some of their offensive rust, but Tannehill is going to be a great regular season quarterback when he's surrounded by talent like this. I just don't know if he's going to ever be a Super Bowl winning caliber quarterback. You gotta know your limitations, and apparently he does not, and neither does the Titans coaching staff. But the Titans are not taking the quarterback here I just needed to get that off my chest they might be losing middle linebacker Jayon Brown to free agency and it was time to find an upgrade anyways this might be a little high for Christian Harris but the Titans are in win now mode and Harris is a three-year starter at Alabama at that point you're basically a second year NFL player right what I'm getting at is they don't want some raw upside guy manning the middle of their defense in 2022 they need a guy that they can trust to hold it down at pick number 27, we've got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Tom Brady-less Buccaneers. Brady's officially retired, and the Bucs are now candidates to take a quarterback in the back half of the first round. They might really like Kyle Trask after spending a year with him, and they'll probably add a Jimmy G or Mitch Trubisky and ride with them for a year or two, but one thing is for sure, this team is going to go back to relying on their defense first and foremost. They're losing a lot of veterans on that side of the ball, though, like JPP and Dominican Sue, Golston, Richard Sherman, and his whole 140 snaps. All of these departures are going to Leave their defensive line with basically Shaq Barrett on the edge, Vita Vey in the middle, Anthony Nelson, and Joe Tryon, Shoyanka, both of which could step into a much larger role, but that's it. That's the defensive front right now. Houston's Logan Hall, no, not that guy, has experience playing all along the defensive line and offers more juice as a pass rusher at this point than Sue and could sneak himself into the first round this year. At number 28, we have got the Green Bay Packers. And sit tight, because I got a lot to say about this. Things are about to look very different for the Packers. I know people are holding out that Aaron Rodgers could return, but stop it. He is worth so much more to you as a trade asset. And honestly, he's got like a mental block in the playoffs right now that he isn't going to get over by losing his best wide receiver to free agency. And that's what's going to have to happen just to keep Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay. You're looking at two first rounders at least in return in a trade. And if you didn't have a young quarterback with next gen protocol, typical skill set then yeah I'd agree that you should milk Rodgers for everything he's got how many times do you need to do this losing in the playoffs thing with one of the top three teams in the NFC every single year build this thing around Jordan Love which can I say is the most marketable quarterback name I've ever seen people looked at me like I was Colin Cowherd when I said that I didn't want to draft Blake Bortles because it just doesn't sound like a name I want my NFL quarterback to have my Madden buddies and I used to call it name math it's basically prehistoric analytics don't think too deeply on it but yeah Devontae Adams is going to leave a huge hole in wide receiver production for the Packers and I know how the Packers like their wide receivers big so here's the next Mike Evans and Drake London honestly it's a travesty that I have him going this low and I've got some selfie vow to do myself because I've got to find an earlier home for him in these mock drafts but NFL teams haven't been valuing wide receivers like they used to but after seeing Jamar Chase and Jalen Waddle teams might make a greater effort to find a guy Drake London has got the highest ceiling of the wide receivers in this draft class and it would be a big middle finger to draft a wide receiver in the first round after neglecting collecting the position for so long with Aaron Rodgers. All right, now we've got the Dolphins on the clock at 29, and literally as I'm recording this, news is breaking that Brian Flores is actually suing the Dolphins and the Giants, and this is actually a pretty crazy story, and if Brian Flores can prove that Dolphins owner Stephen Ross offered him 100 k per loss during the 2019 NFL season, then there might be some huge changes, not only in Dolphins ownership, but in the way that the draft is conducted altogether. We might end up having a draft lottery. Like, this is pretty crazy stuff. Like, we always knew they were trying to tank for Tua, but we we didn't think they took it that seriously and I had this whole spiel in here about I was surprised that it was Brian Flores driving the Deshaun Watson rumors but now Flores is actually saying that Stephen Ross brought him onto a yacht and that a quarterback just happened to be in the area that he wanted him to meet with and that Brian Flores actually declined this could potentially hugely backfire in Stephen Ross's face so that's definitely something to stay tuned to but now I'm concerned that Brian Flores might not get a job in the NFL again because you know blackball is a thing. Originally, Stephen Ross tried to blame it on Flores in the front office not seeing eye to eye, and I was going to rush to Flores' defense because how are you going to have patience or see eye to eye with this front office after they've wasted so many picks on this offensive line? The Dolphins literally have the youngest, most terrible offensive line you may ever see, and don't worry, they've only spent a first, two seconds, a third, and a fourth in the last two years trying to fix it. The sunk cost dilemma here cannot prevent the Dolphins from fixing this issue. The ultimate question here is whether or not they 
they will draft an offensive tackle with an athletic ceiling from a power five school once again, or maybe try a small school guy this time like Trevor Penning from Northern Iowa. Penning looks like a Jake Long type of offensive tackle, while Nicholas Petit Ferrer is built like a young Tyron Smith, but also might remind them too much of an Austin Jackson. At pick number 30, we've got the Kansas City Chiefs. And let me just say, for on the real, they've got to find a way to tone down Brittany and Jackson Mahomes. I believe in manifestation, and I have never seen this before, where the wife and brother of a quarterback have been the sole reason that people were rooting against you. We, as football fans, rooted against a guy like Tom Brady because we were just tired of seeing him winning Super Bowls all the time. But this is some toxic shit. The Chiefs, as an organization, have got to get under wraps. But getting back to football, Traylon Burks would give this offense another weapon that Mahomes could trust in those big moments when Tyreek Hill has been taken away and Travis Kelsey can't get away from double teams. Burks would be what they hoped Josh Gordon could be. Now, McCole Hardman is a great gadget player and insurance policy in case you lose Tyreek Hill to an injury because you've got to maintain that speed with the Mahomes' arm. But they need a classic Z wide receiver. Once again, though, these wide receivers got so disrespected in this mock, and I'll admit, Traylon Burks is my number one wide receiver right now. So David Bell from Purdue, he might be a more realistic option at 30, to be honest, and still a really good fit for this offense. Now remember, this is before the Super Bowl, and this order is just based on where their records would have them slotted. But it is the start of the Lunar New Year. It's the year of the Tiger. I would not be surprised if the Bengals pull this thing off and uh, end up picking at 32. But as for now, we've got the Bengals at 31, and you know how I know that Joe Burrow is legit? He carried this sorry excuse for an offensive line all the way to the Super Bowl. It's not quite as bad as the Dolphins, but it's pretty weak from a potential standpoint. And Joe's got also to get better at sensing the pressure, but in his defense, he barely gets to finish his drop back before before the pocket begins to collapse. The only linchpin in this unit is Jonah Williams, and he actually needs to be re-signed. I've always felt like he'd be an elite guard, but they haven't moved him yet, and he's about to get paid like a left tackle, so he's probably staying at left tackle. However, the right tackle position here still needs to be addressed, so instead of getting cute with Nicholas Petit Ferrer, I'm gonna go with Central Michigan's Bernard Raymond, one of the best names in the draft. Bernard Raymond. The former tight end is from Austria and only has two years experience playing offensive line, so while he's extremely raw, his arrow is definitely pointed up. And then at number 32, we have got the Detroit Lions on the clock. And this is probably the closest the Lions are ever going to get to uh, actually winning a Super Bowl. Remember, this is one of the picks that they got in exchange for Matthew Stafford. And I think it would be really fitting for them to take their quarterback of the future here. Jared Goof, I mean Goff, is going to cost $30 million against the cap for a few more years. But there is a chance to get out of his contract next offseason with it only counting $10 million against the cap. And then if it's a post-June 1st cut, it's only $5 million in dead cap. I love the quarterback risk with a late first rounder because if it pays off it could have Lamar Jackson like impact to this Lions franchise plus you still get that fifth year option and with Malik Willis you're gonna want that because you're gonna have to be patient with him Jared Goff does buy you a year to work with Malik Willis because he's gonna need help learning how to read a defense the guy has got athleticism for days and is actually really accurate for a mobile quarterback but getting to his second and third reads is gonna be crucial for him to be a long-term success at the NFL level that's going to do it for my mock draft, guys. Let me know what you thought in the comments. Please let me know who you think is missing from this mock draft. What players have I not given enough credit to? Also, I'd love to hear some sleepers or some players that you've seen that you don't think have gotten enough public recognition. Once again, don't forget to hit that like button. It would be really helpful for this channel to get off on a hot start during draft season. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. Stick around for a little while. And maybe I will see you all in the next video.